God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. So glad that you came to worship with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. And I want to share with you for a few minutes this morning about believer's baptism. Actually, we've been working our way through the letter of 2 Corinthians. And we're going to continue there next week. But I wanted to take a moment and I wanted to divert a little bit this morning. And I wanted to share some things with you about believer's baptism baptism. While you find your way to Matthew chapter 3, just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all your gifts. Thank you for all your prayers for phase 2. Um, we're moving forward with construction. This last week they put in a big tank in the ground um, that's got to go underneath the building. It's all part of our new septic system. Um, our whole new septic system is installed now. Um, we're going to start uh, putting on the base. We have one more parking lot uh, that's going in on the far corner of our property. We're going to start putting that in and the walls are going to begin this week. And so thank you for your prayers. Next week I'm going to take a few minutes and I'm just going to quantify for you um, some of the amazing things the Lord has done. We have had miracles of giving and we have had miracles of savings on construction and um, it's just really amazing. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. But if you have your Bibles, look with me in Matthew chapter 3. Let's talk about believer's baptism for a few minutes this morning. Matthew 3 and beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is drawing near to you. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey, and all God's people said, yuck. <laughs> people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to unfasten. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Why are you coming to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. I'm going to explain that to you in just a minute. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. I'm well pleased with him. Just looking at the first couple words of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Let's pray and then just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here with us. And thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Lord, the letter kills, but the words you give, they're spirit and life. I pray that you would breathe on us through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen, amen. and amen. This afternoon, we're going to share together one of the most sacred acts in our Christian faith. The ordinance of believer's baptism. What's wonderful about believer's baptism is that it is a transformational moment that we all get to witness. We all get to celebrate it and be part of it. With accepting Christ, that's not always the case. Sometimes people accept Christ publicly and sometimes privately. Sometimes people get baptized in the Holy Spirit publicly and sometimes privately. But believer's baptism is always a public affair. There are always witnesses there to celebrate. 
We have a lot of people signed up already, and there's still time for you to sign up. If you want to be baptized today, you can come to the altar right at the end of this service. You can meet Pastor Faith right over here in this corner, and she'll give you the information that you need to be part of our baptism today. But I want to take a few minutes, and I want to share with you three truths about believers' baptism. If you haven't been baptized yet, I want you to listen and I want you to respond. If you have been baptized, I want you to remember your baptism and I want you to rejoice. Three truths about believer's baptism. The first truth is this. Believer's baptism is not a religious ritual. It is a heart response to God. Beloved, I want to tell you that believer's baptism in the Bible is not the same thing as infant baptism or christening. I was born into a Presbyterian family. I was christened. I was baptized as a baby. I wonder how many people in this service you were also baptized by your parents as a baby. Let me, yeah, just, just about everybody in every one of our services. The last service it was about two-thirds. I don't know what's wrong with those heathens, but in all the other services, just about everybody in the service was baptized as a baby. I want to say that if you were baptized as a baby, I believe that that's meaningful to the extent that it was a sincere expression of faith on the part of your parents. If we're really honest, a lot of couples today just don't pursue the Lord. Church isn't a very big part of their lives and so infant baptism is just an occasion to celebrate the arrival of a baby. Sometimes parents have approached me here at harvest time and they've asked me to dedicate babies as we do here and I can tell that they're just not really so interested in the spiritual aspect as the occasion to celebrate. You know I used to get mad about that but now I take any opportunity someone will give me to lay my hands on a baby and bless him or bless her in the name of Jesus because my blessing is powerful even if mom and dad don't realize it. Some couples don't really have a strong conviction about baptizing their babies, but they do it to please their parents. They do it to keep the peace. They do it to keep up appearances. For some couples, infant baptism is motivated by fear. It is a fire insurance ritual. We have to get the baby baptized so that the baby doesn't end up in limbo. Beloved, I want to tell you from the Word of God, there is no such place as limbo. Children who die before the age of accountability go directly to be with the Lord. When people of mature understanding die, they either go to heaven or they go to hell, depending on whether or not they have received Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Your eternal destiny does not hinge on a religious ritual, particularly not on one that was done to you at an age when you didn't even know what was going on. For some couples, infant baptism is a sincere expression of their particular faith and it's a sincere desire to see their child know the Lord, to be part of the church. And that is sincerely meaningful. But it is not the same thing as believer's baptism in the Bible. Beloved, infant baptism is not the baptism that was administered by John nor commanded by Jesus nor practiced by the early church. Infant baptism is a religious ritual. Believer's baptism is a heart response to God. After 400 years of prophetic silence in Israel, a man called John burst onto the scene, preaching in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is drawing near to you. Large crowds of people from Jerusalem and the surrounding suburbs came out into the wilderness and confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Although baptism was familiar to the Jewish people, what John was doing was something completely novel. It was something completely different. In those days when a Gentile converted to Judaism, part of that conversion process was water baptism. 
During the ceremony, the convert would baptize himself by dipping himself under the water. And then he would receive a new Jewish name and a new set of clothing. I like the symbolism there. But in the wilderness, John was doing something that no one had ever seen before. John was administering the baptism and he was baptizing Jews into a new religious movement. The water baptism that was introduced by John and Jesus was something completely new and it was something uniquely Christian. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they came down to see what was this new religious ritual and John said to them, hey, you sons of snakes. Now there's some real warm, affirming, seeker-sensitive language for you right there, right? Jesus said, hey, when you went down to the wilderness to see John, what did you go to see? Did you go to see a reed blowing in the wind? He said, no, you went to see a prophet and a prophet you got. Hey, you sons of snakes, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What John was saying to them is, this is no religious ritual going on here. This is a genuine heart response to God. This is people turning back to God. That's what the word repent means. It means to turn back to him after having rebelled against him. It means to turn back to him after having turned away from him. John said this is people repairing the road in anticipation of his approach. That's what it means to prepare the way. It literally, literally means to repair a highway in your town because you're expecting a royal visit and so you make that road. You fill in all the holes. You prepare it so that the king can come to you. John said this is people getting their hearts right with God. This is people rebuilding their broken relationship with him. This is people restoring their lost connection with his presence. Beloved, believers baptism is not a religious ritual. It is an instinctive response that follows a change in your heart. When Jesus has changed your heart, there's something inside of you that wants to get into the water. That's the way it was for the Ethiopian official in Acts chapter 8. He had traveled to Jerusalem to worship. And while he was there, he acquired a scroll of Isaiah, a very rare and very precious and very costly acquisition to add to the treasury of Queen Candace. Because he was a eunuch, because he was castrated, he was not permitted to worship in the temple. He could not become a convert to Judaism. He could not undergo the baptism of conversion into Judaism. But on the ride home, he was reading Isaiah 53, and he didn't understand it. So the Holy Spirit sent Philip out for a jog on the same deserted road. Philip jogged up alongside the chariot, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian official was reading these verses. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so... He did not open up his mouth. And the Ethiopian official said to Philip, tell me who is the prophet talking about? And Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And somewhere along the road, the Ethiopian official believed. And when they came to a pool of water, he said, here is some water, baptize me. You see, that's the instinctive response of a heart that has believed in Jesus. Here is some water. Baptize me. My parents had me baptized as an infant. And I'm sure that to the extent it reflected an expression of faith on their part, it was meaningful. But I was baptized as a believer in Jesus when I was almost 10. And it was a moment of pure heart response to God. Back in the 70s, not, not many of you were around long enough to remember that, but back in the 70s there used to be these massive outdoor gatherings called the Jesus Festivals. 50, 60, 70,000 people would gather in the cornfields in Pennsylvania. You know, it was like Woodstock, but it was a Holy Spirit Woodstock. It was like Woodstock without all the drugs and everything else, and it was all the good stuff. There was worship and there was preaching on a big stage, a big outdoor stage. And there were huge circus tents where they had ministry. 
One afternoon, my mom and my sister Lisa went down to one of the ministry tents to receive prayer for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I went down to the lake by myself to watch the water baptism. There were literally hundreds of people being water baptized. And I only went to watch, but as I stood there, my heart starting, started pounding and I wanted to get water baptized so badly. I don't know how many pastors there were in the water baptizing people, but at one point a man locked his eyes with mine and he stretched out his hand like this to me. You know, when I get to heaven someday, I'm going to find him and I'm going to thank him for being so sensitive to the Holy Spirit in that moment. I wasn't quite 10 yet. My mom wasn't there to ask permission. I didn't know if I'd get in trouble. I didn't have a baptism class. I didn't have a theology of baptism. I didn't have a baptismal gown. I didn't have a bathing suit. I didn't have a towel and I didn't care. I had to get baptized. So I walked right out of my shoes and I walked straight into the water. Dads and moms, I'm going to say this to you. Even if your children are young, if they express that kind of urgency to get baptized, just go with it because it's the Holy Spirit. Believers, baptism isn't a religious ritual. It's a heart response to God. Here is some water. Baptize me. Perhaps there's someone here who... You feel that inner desire to get baptized, but fear is holding you back. Maybe you're afraid of replacing your infant baptism. I'm going to tell you, you're not replacing it. You're just doing what Jesus said. Maybe you're afraid of invalidating your membership in another church or dishonoring your parents. Listen, their sincere expression of faith was meaningful, but now it's your turn to express your own faith in Jesus Christ and receive believer's baptism. You can tell your mom and dad, mom and dad, thank you for that meaningful experience that you shared with me as a baby, but this is different. This is believer's baptism. Three truths about believer's baptism. The second truth is this. Believer's baptism is not merely symbolic, but it is a spiritual, significant spiritual transaction. I want you to notice with me in Matthew chapter 3 that first of all, John did not regard his baptism as a merely symbolic act. He regarded it as an actual spiritual transaction. And second, when Jesus was baptized, he had a spiritual encounter. Believer's baptism is a spiritual transaction. It is a spiritual encounter. I remember going down into the water. I remember coming back up again. I remember people I didn't even know hugging me on the shore of the lake. I remember how I felt in my heart walking back to my campsite. I remember the joy in my heart. I remember feeling changed. I remember how close I felt to God. I remember being more committed in my love for Christ and more bold about my love for Christ. Maybe you were raised in the evangelical church and maybe you were taught that baptism is symbolic. We say it this way, baptism is an outward sign of an inner change. Baptism is a symbol that our old man has died and that we have started a new life in Christ. That happened the moment that we received Christ by faith. Baptism is a public testimony to others that we have made a commitment to follow Jesus now with our whole heart. Listen, baptism surely is all of those things, but it is still more than those things. Believer's baptism is an act of humble obedience that actually accomplishes something profoundly supernatural. John believed that his baptism was an actual spiritual transaction. That's why he stopped the unrepentant Pharisees from getting baptized. That's why he tried to stop Jesus who did not need to repent from being baptized. You see, baptism is an act of repentance. It is an outward physical demonstration of repentance that results in an inner spiritual change. It's not the physical water that cleanses, but the cleansing happens because of the faith and the humility and the desire that is expressed in the act of baptism. John the Baptist believed that. Peter believed that. Paul and Luke and John the beloved apostle believed that. And so did the early church. 
In believer's baptism, there's a humble expression of spiritual neediness. There is an expression of spiritual desire. We're saying, God, I need you. God, I I want you. God, I want your cleansing. I want your refreshing. God, I'm returning to you. You know, sometimes people have been baptized earlier in life and they want to get baptized again after having been away from the Lord and coming back to him. And I want to tell you, it's always okay with me because that's what baptism is. It's a time of renewal. God, I want to connect with you. Naaman the leper wasn't healed by the waters of the Jordan River. He was healed by his humility. He was healed by his obedience to God's word spoken through the prophet Elisha. He was healed by faith in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so it is with believers' baptism. It is not the water that washes you. It's just pool water. But it is the humility and the obedience and the faith that is expressed in the act that releases an inner cleansing from the Holy Spirit. My old pastor and father in the Lord was the one who trained me in baptism. He was English. And he always said to me, Glenn, I always try to make baptism as dignified as possible because it is a humiliating experience. And it's true. It is humbling to get doused in front of a whole crowd of witnesses. I'll never forget the very first time that I ever baptized for real, prime time. You know, in Bible college, we practiced on each other. But when I was first in ministry working at my home church, we had, a, we, we had water baptism once a month. And we used to baptize 25, 30, sometimes 50 people every month at my home church. And so it was my first time, prime time, live in front of, in front of a real congregation. And uh, I was going to baptize some young adults. And then my pastor was going to baptize some other people. And he said to me before the service, he said, Glenn, be careful. He said, Walter, our maintenance man, he said he hasn't quite put uh, as much water in the tank as usual. The tank's a little low. And so the very first girl that they gave me to baptize was a girl named Jennifer Slaymaker. And they forgot to tell me that she was afraid of getting wet. She was afraid of putting her face in the water, under the water. And so we went through the preliminaries and I went to dip her in and baptize her and she held her head up out of the water. So on the way back up, I noticed that she hadn't gone all the way under and I said, that won't do. You got to get all the way wet. And so I double dipped her only when I double dipped her I kind of lost my balance and I lost my momentum and she and I both fell in the water together and so the last thing that 800 people saw sitting out there was me and Jennifer Slaymaker disappearing behind the rail of the baptistry. It's true baptism is a humbling experience but what work does baptism accomplish? What does baptism accomplish? Well for one thing Baptism is an act of identification with Jesus that mortifies our sin nature. John believed that his baptism accomplished a spiritual transaction. That's why he tried to stop Jesus from being baptized. He recognized that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus didn't need to repent. Jesus didn't need to turn back to God. He didn't need to repair the highway. John said, no, Jesus, this is not right. I need you to administer your greater baptism of fire to me. But Jesus said, do it, John. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill righteousness. Now listen, here's what that means. Jesus' baptism was an act of identification with us. In his baptism, Jesus was fulfilling all the righteousness and all the prophecies of the Old Testament. Isaiah said, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. Listen, he will bear their iniquities. He poured out his life unto death and he was, listen, numbered with the transgressors. When Jesus was baptized, he identified with us as sinners. He identified with the penitent. He identified with the poor in spirit. He identified with those who mourn over their sins. He identified with the humble in heart. He identified with the spiritually hungry and thirsty. Paul said Jesus humbled himself and became obedient in every way. And Jesus' baptism was part of that. 
Hebrews says he was not ashamed to call us brothers. He shared in our humanity. He became like us in every way in order that he might become our merciful high priest. Jesus' baptism was one more way in which he became like us and shared in our humanity. Jesus didn't have to repent of anything, but in receiving baptism, he identified fully with our sinful humanity for which he died vicariously on the cross of Calvary. Jesus was baptized to identify with us and listen, we are baptized to identify with him. Jesus was baptized to identify with our sinful humanity and we are baptized to identify with his victorious resurrection life. Baptism is more than just an outward symbol. It is a symbol of an inward change, but it's more than that. It's a sacred act of identification with Christ. When we go down into that water, we identify with his death. When we are submerged, we identify with his burial. When we are raised up again, we identify with the power of his resurrection, not just symbolically, but actually. And this sacred act of identification, Paul says, accomplishes the spiritual work of mortifying our sin nature. Colossians 2 verse 11, in him you were also circumcised in the putting off of your sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, listen, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Just like Naaman the leper, something happens when you enter the waters of baptism with a heart full of faith. He received an outward cleansing from leprosy. We receive an inner spiritual cleansing from sin. Beloved, bondages to sin wash off in the waters of baptism. Addictions wash off in the waters of baptism. Sinful habits wash off in the waters of baptism. Destructive ways of living, self-loathing, isolation, they wash off in the waters of baptism. Going back to college days, I had a good friend that the Lord delivered from heavy addiction to drugs when he became a believer. He was instantly set free from major addiction. But he had a lingering addiction to pot. He would toke up and then the next day he would be full of remorse. He would destroy his stash and then he would repent and tell God sincerely, God, I will never do it again. How many have you ever been there? And then a few days later, he was right back at it again. Paul explained that frustration. He said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who will deliver me from this body of flesh? And the enemy, the enemy began to play with his mind. The enemy began to say, see, this isn't real. You're not really changed. Finally, our church was having a water baptism service and he cried out to God and he said, God, if this is real, you have to deliver me from pot at my baptism. He went down into the waters of baptism addicted to pot. But when he was lowered into the water, he identified with Jesus' death. While he was submerged, he identified with Jesus' burial. When he was raised up out of the water again, he identified with Jesus' victorious Christian life. He came up out of that water a new creation. Old things passed away and he was made new. That was 30 years ago and he is still completely drug free and loving Jesus. Heard a true story in the last year. A friend of mine pastoring in Ontario, Canada, had a young girl that came to their congregation and she had suffered from severe depression. She, uh, was, she hated herself. She was uh, suicidal and she was a cutter. And she had spent several years in high school and college cutting with a razor, cutting her arms. And she had scars up and down her arms from cutting. 
Christ delivered her from those things when she came to Jesus. And then there came time for water baptism. And when she was baptized, when she came up out of the water, God completely healed her from all of those scars from the cutting and removed them completely from both of her arms. I want to tell you that there's power in baptism. It's not in the water, but it's power that God releases in the act of faith. What does believer's baptism accomplish? Believer's baptism opens the door for new spiritual encounters. Jesus didn't need to be baptized for repentance, but after he was baptized, he was clothed with the anointing. It was part of his preparation for ministry. And believer's baptism does the same thing for you. It removes the barrier between heaven and you. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened up. The veil between this physical world and the spiritual world was removed. Jesus could see the presence of God clearly. He could hear the voice of God clearly. The very next words after his baptism was the spirit led him forward. Believer's baptism opens up your spirit to the heavenly realm. It repairs the highway so that God's presence can come to you. It opens your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears. It gives you capacity to perceive his presence and comprehend spiritual truths. If you're having I understand hard time wrapping your mind around the things of God and around the truths of scripture and you can't understand the Bible I'll ask you have you received believers baptism yet because you need that experience to open up the spiritual realm to you it increases your capacity to receive his guidance believers baptism this is good preaching here by the way just saying believers baptism releases the anointing of the Holy Spirit on you Jesus could not have fulfilled righteousness. He could not have discharged his earthly ministry. He could not have fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies without the experience of baptism. Just before his passion, the Pharisees questioned Jesus in the temple about the source of his authority and Jesus directed them back to the moment of his baptism. It wasn't necessary for Jesus to be cleansed, but when he was washed in the waters of baptism, it was just like the preparation of every prophet and every servant of God and every holy thing. He was washed with a ceremonial washing and he received the anointing of the Holy Spirit for ministry. The Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and alighted on Jesus. And in, in that baptism, Jesus received his anointing and authority for ministry, and so do we. In Galatians 3.26, Paul said, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Christ means anointing, so when you get baptized, you are clothed with the anointing and authority for ministry. Believer's baptism releases the Father's affirmation on you. In baptism, the father affirmed Jesus. He said, this is my beloved son. I am well pleased in him. And when you're baptized, the father's affirmation comes on you too. The Holy Spirit, who is the seal of ownership on your heart, tells you with every beat of your heart that you are his. You're his son. You're his daughter. He's your father. You belong to him. He belongs to you. You feel the pleasure of the Lord that makes you whole. And and believers baptism releases joy on you. When you walk through the book of Acts, you'll discover that baptism is always accompanied by joy. In Jerusalem, when 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost, there was joy. In Samaria, when they believed and they were baptized, there was great joy in the city. When he was baptized, the Ethiopian official went on his way full of joy. The Philippian jailer and his house, Lydia and her house, they were full of joy, joy, joy. And when you're baptized, an abiding joyfulness comes over your spirit. Three truths about believer's baptism. It is not a ritual, it's a heart response. It is not only symbolic, it is a significant spiritual transaction. And finally this, believer's baptism is not optional. It is an essential part of Christian conversion. Worship team, you can come and help me finish. Believer's baptism is not optional. It is essential. Beloved, listen to me. Baptism was demonstrated by Jesus. 
it was commanded by Jesus and it was practiced by the early church. Truth is, we are just a little too casual about believers' baptism these days. We're just a little too nonchalant about it. Part of it is a lack of good teaching. Part of it is our pop culture, which strips the meaning out of absolutely everything. Part of it here at Harvest Time is that we've never had a baptistry in our building for 32 years. And uh, we're about to fix that. We're going to have a good one in phase two. By the way, I don't get in the... I'm so traumatized over dropping Jennifer Slaymaker that I don't, I don't get in the water anymore. So we always use two people to baptize. Uh, and I just, I just stand outside and pray and that nobody gets dropped. But listen, not having a nice, cozy, warm water baptistry didn't stop people in the old days. And it still doesn't stop believers all around the world from getting baptized as soon as they have received Jesus. You know, for years when I used to announce water baptism services, I used to be too wimpy about it. I used to say, if you've never been baptized since you've been a believer, prayerfully consider it. Baloney. You never have to pray about obeying Jesus. I've altered my announcement forever. If you have never been baptized in water since becoming a believer, I want you to obey Jesus and do it. See, beloved, when we do what the Bible says, we receive the results the Bible promises. Water baptism is not optional. It's an essential part of conversion to Christianity. It's an essential part of discipleship. It's an essential part of your walk with Christ and the ministry He wants to manifest through you. It's an essential part of following Jesus. Before Jesus ascended to the Father, He said, go and make disciples of all nations back them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. On the day of Pentecost, the people of Jerusalem cried out under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call and 3,000 people were baptized that day when the Samaritans believed they were baptized in water when the Ethiopian official believed he was baptized in water when the Gentiles at Cornelius house believed they were baptized in water when Lydia believed she was baptized in water and her whole house when the Philippian warden believed he was baptized in water and his whole house. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved and your whole house. You know what? One of my favorite things, sometimes we get to baptize whole families together all at once. It's my most favorite thing. It's a beautiful thing. When the Corinthians believed, they were baptized in water. When the Ephesians believed 20 years later, they were baptized in water. When Paul was knocked off his high horse by Jesus, on the Damascus road and he became a believer, he was baptized in water. Ananias said to him, and now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to someone here today. What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized, calling on his name. Three truths about believer's baptism. It is not a ritual. It's a heart response. It's not only a symbol. It's a significant transaction. And it's not optional. It's an essential part of following Jesus. Would you stand on your feet this morning and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise.